Today, we're thrilled to be joined by Christopher Thomas Moore, the Chief Digital Officer for Domino's Pizza. With over 15 years of experience in e-commerce, digital marketing, and brand development, Christopher has been an innovator, a builder, and a forward thinker in the marketplace. Christopher, otherwise known as CTM, <laughs> so great to see you. Great to see you as well. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for taking the time um, during your busy CES schedule um, to be uh, with us today. Talk to me about why somebody in your role comes to CES here in Vegas and what you hope to get out of it. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much here. Um, and, you know, CES is a, a hub of innovation, right? And it's really, I come here and um, actually the brand hasn't been here in a while. Yeah. Um, and so this is the first year that we've had real representation here. But for me, it was important to be here to really understand kind of what's on this next frontier, right? The last time I was here, we saw folding phones, right? And we needed to understand what does that mean for our customer experiences, right? And so things like that are the next future innovations that you see when you come to an event like CES. And so I'm really excited to see what's next. And, and, and what is next? Like, what are some things that you've seen here that are interesting to you that you're like, oh, wow, this is interesting. We should think about this for our brand yeah, in so 24. Honestly, I've not made it yet. Okay, gotcha. Floor. So that's that's my goal to, to yeah. get there uh, this afternoon and tomorrow to really do a deep dive and see what I can see. Yeah, I'm sure AI is an area, just given the scale that you have, the interactions that customers have with your brand in a multitude of different ways is something that you've been thinking about. What yeah. are your thoughts on the role of generative AI and other forms of AI? for your go-to-market strategy moving forward? You know, I think AI for me um, sits in a spectrum of, um, you know, believability, but also I have a little bit of, you know, a pessimistic as aspect okay. and, and viewpoint as well. Um, in the sense of, I think that um, when there's a lot of hype, uh, on the topic, but I don't feel as though there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to refine the space, right? From, you know, government and legislative concerns yeah. to really understanding how do we find true adoption in industry for this, right? Specific use cases that can be picked up and ran by organizations, you know, there's not... There are some of those that exist, but not fully replicatable uh, across all industries. And so, like, I feel like there's still a lot of refinement and learning that we have in the space of, you know, AI, generative AI, machine learning, you know, all of it buckled together. And um, so I'm interested to understand how we get there. Right. Yeah. And it's going to take some time. Um, and so I, I kind of believe some of the hype, but I have to see it to, to really believe. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I think when it comes to the things like customer service and yes. chatbots, I mean, you're already starting to see some of the airlines and some of the financial service institutions integrate it. Yes. To me, that seems like a way where you can really provide personalization and service at scale. Absolutely. When you have it sitting on like a language model, data sets, and specifically for like FAQ, service-related items, it definitely helps take out um, some of the resourcing that would be needed to do that work, yeah. right? But as you start talking about consumer personalization and their experiences, changing behaviors, like there's still a lot more to learn of about course. this space. And one thing I've experienced um, in the past year is that a lot of large enterprise brands are just, they talk about the the, the promise of it, but yeah. when it comes to brass tax and actually implementing it, exactly. the lawyers get involved and yes. they say, well, what about privacy, <laughs> legal concern, yeah. this and that, and it's just, it's gonna be a very slow roll. It's 100%, not gonna happen, right? And, like content ownership, yeah. like who owns this content that's right. being created, you know? And so there's still a lot that we have to figure out. And, and so that's why I think for me, um, I wanna learn, I wanna lean in. Yeah. But I'm not putting all my eggs in a basket until it's really a, a little clear. Yeah, and social media was kind of the same way where <laughs> when it first came out, brands were so scared. They were scared about losing ownership of their mm -hmm. brand, what a consumer is going to do with it. And it took some time mm -hmm. for brands to really understand that it really shaped, shook out. And there's still a lot of controversy with social media as it relates to its impact on our culture and society. Exactly. Morally. Or even voice. You know, I remember 2015, voice is the future. Oh, and, you still know, never got there. Yeah, it never did, right? Yeah. It hit a plateau. And so, like, I, um, so, I'm, I'm watching, observing, testing, learning, um, but really interested to see where we go. Yeah, I'm sure there were times at Domino's where you guys had conversations. Are consumers, consumers going to say, hey, Siri, order me a pizza? Mm -hmm. But I'm sure it doesn't really happen a lot right now. So we do have those offerings right. under uh, what we call our Anywhere offering, where you can tweet, you can send a text, you know, all these things. But you're right. It's a very infrequent Okay. I think ultimately it's about what consumer problem are you solving? Exactly. And, and to cop on the Domino's app in order is so easy that doing it other ways and changing that behavior, it's not, it doesn't really solve a problem. That's incredible. No. Marketers lose that a lot. Yeah. 
They exactly. get caught up on bleeding edge stuff. But not and ultimately, they... it's like, are you really solving a problem Absolutely. that a consumer has? And that's a big part of how we view where we have the biggest breakthrough is okay. leaning in on those customer tensions, right? What are the tensions that exist that a brand action could alleviate that tension, right? And so it could be in the products that we offer, the messaging, um, you know, all of those kind of factor into where we find our biggest breakthrough, yeah, right? So, and not, yeah. just, not just the novelty of it. Exactly, exactly. A lot of, I think a lot of marketers get caught up on really losing the vision of what's cutting edge and what's bleeding edge and yes. bleeding edge might get you into ad weed yes right but ultimately <laughs> is it really going to drive an roi completely is it going to make sense and that's completely yeah and completely yeah it's like are you are, are you trying to create a press release or are you trying to create a business yes exactly <laughs> and sometimes you do a little bit of both yeah. right and so we we, we have a, a view of what we call tequity and so there are certain investments that we make in technology that do drive equity for the overall brand, but don't have the result of driving the revenue to the bottom line in the sense of people using that actual technology, right? Yeah. But it provides the halo that drives more customers to the brand because we're a smart tech leaning right. brand, it's right? Part of building the brand. Exactly. And so, but it's not everything, right? Yeah. Like you gotta have a balance there. Yeah. So you joined Domino's um, in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, so you're entering, you know, year six, and the change your industry has seen, mm -hmm. like so many others, has been sort of mind blowing because you had COVID, where yeah. I'm sure you had just so many challenges and so many opportunities. 100%. Given, and now we're kind of post COVID and we're trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about your journey at Domino's and what have those changes been and what have they meant for your role and, and where your focus is. Yeah, so I've had a number of hats that I've worn over the time at Domino's, um, been really fortunate. Uh, you know, the brand um, and our culture inside the brand is one where they feel like smart people do smart work regardless of where they are. So I've been able to do a lot of different things. And so I started on the e-com, global e-com and digital marketing side. Uh, but then during the pandemic, I actually had responsibility for our menu, so all of the product. And, and so going and learning that process of building food and learning how to do that and do all of the qualitative research in the middle of a pandemic wow. was um, really interesting. But um, so I've I had a number of different, four different roles or so that I've had since I've been with the brand. Um, and it's this constant evolution um, that I feel really privileged to have the opportunity to, you know, have TV media and digital media and product and all these other things that have refined my viewpoint and understanding of the brand, right? Having responsibility for product, I learned so much about our operations I'm sure. in that process, you yeah. know, that it completely changed my perspective is now I have responsibility for the technology in the store. Having that strong understanding of both the product and the operations helps make that really possible for me to really help think through where some of those challenges and how we get through some of those challenges. Yeah, I mean, so many people get dropped into digital roles or marketing roles and they don't really have an appreciation for how the sausage is made. Oh, 100%. So and then 100%. The, their marketing doesn't really translate because it doesn't fit with the, the inner workings of the business. A hundred percent. So I feel very privileged to have a lens that's pretty broad of the organization, um, which I try to um, make sure that I apply to yeah. you know my role. It's interesting because your title of Chief Digital Officer you know, now everything's digital, yeah. even TV. Yeah. <laughs> no, we've spoken to a lot of executives yeah. in the TV world, TV shifting digital. So, you you know, there's not much that you would do. It's not like you have people on the street corner handing out yeah. flyers, right? <laughs> that isn't digital. We still do a little wobble boarding every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you define the uh, the role of Chief Digital Officer at yeah. Domino's and what is success look like for you in 2024? Yeah, it's one that helps drive and define you know, our strategy as it relates to digital interactions and touch points with our customers, as well as our team members in the store. So it's really thinking about experiences from different lenses, depending on who that end user is. And so um, it's really kind of painting that vision, organizing the organization to really kind of approach those challenges that we have. So the, one of the main pieces I'm sure is the app, because the app mm -hmm. is a huge touch point. Um, it is. I'm sure, I mean, I would imagine a very small percentage of customers are actually picking up the phone and ordering pizza anymore. Yeah, there there are some that still exist. Like is we it have 5%? tried. No, it's a little more than that. It but is. we've we've tried really hard to uh, bring and shift yeah. those over. But right now, we're a little over eighty percent of our our businesses, our sales are coming from. I would digital. think millennials is ninety five. Yeah, plus, yeah I would right? agree. Yeah. I mean, they hate talking on the phone to begin exactly. with. Right? Even <laughs> even to their mom, they don't like talking on the yeah. phone. But, uh, so. Um, so the so when you think about the experience of the app, yeah, because that could make or break the business, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, 
what what does that look like? Like what works, um, you know, and what are your consumers asking for? Yeah, uh, when it comes to the app experience. When we when we think about ecom, you know, for the Domino's brand, what's been very very vital to our success is a test and learn strategy. Mm -hmm. So we run, you know, over a hundred different tests a year to understand just the nuances of the experience. Like UX you know? testing, UX and UI testing, exactly. Uh -huh. So from you know placement of content to colors to ex whole experience flows, right? We're constantly iterating on our experiences to understand where opportunities to alleviate those tension points to make a more fluid experience for our customers. And what would make that change? Because ultimately you're still selling pizza. Like why would it be different in 2020 than 2024 in terms of the UX? Is it based upon broader cultural changes that make consumers expect different things, technological changes? Yeah, I mean, like our our customer expectations are predicated on all the experiences that they have, right? right. Not just the food experiences that they have, right? And so some of it is understanding the current trends and expectations that exist. Some are some is defining what those new trends and experiences should be. But um, but we do see that even still with small changes uh, could have really meaningful impact in the compounding effect of those small changes yeah. really drive the brand forward. Yeah, I mean, with, with the amount of volume you have, mm -hmm. you know, a couple basis points of conversion. Yeah. Uh, reducing it's breakage. Massive. Yeah, because if they're like, oh, screw it, I'm just going to go on seamless. Exactly. It doesn't work. And yeah. that happens. It might not seem like a big deal, like in spots, but when you when you actually add that up across all your markets, all 100%. your touch points. It's huge. Right. It's and really then you huge. probably have also just the checkout process, I would imagine, with Apple Pay, Venmo, PayPal, and making it easier for consumers to pay. How have how has that changed over the years? As yeah. Well? I mean, it's actually been evolving even in more recent terms. Yeah. So we've launched Venmo, we have Apple Pay. And um, what it is, is that um, meeting the customer where they are, right? Providing optionality that's convenient for them versus what we want them to do. Exactly. And um, and we find when we do that, regardless of where it is in experience, payments, it could be sign-in, it could be whatever, it just alleviates some of that tension that helps drive it a, a cleaner conversion. Yeah, it's all about convenience. I mean, think about 100%. the success of Uber. The one number one thing Uber did is just save people time. Mm -hmm. And they didn't even need to talk to the driver. It's like... It's just a seamless way that they can live. They get yeah. into a car and they get out of a car. It's as seamless as possible. 100%. And I imagine saving time is a huge part of the overall It strategy. is. I mean, when we think about our brand, you know, our brand is a, a part of an individual's experience in life, you know? And if we could take something out of that, make your life a little easier, hey, that's a win Ordering for us, pizza you know? and getting, getting something I want to eat in my house is it now is something that's easier, saves me time. It's a seamless experience. It makes so my I lives easier. Put my energy somewhere else. Yeah. Right. And so like that's what our goal is when we think about our our the experiences that we're building is really how can we bring joy in the experience to the consumer? But then how can we, you know, again, just make it as simple as possible. Yeah. You know. I know your Domino's rewards program yes. is a huge and it makes sense. I mean, right now all the things we're hearing are so consistent across category. You talk about the challenges with the cookie and, you know, privacy and the changes Google is doing. And we mm -hmm. talk about with that, the importance of first party data. Mm -hmm. You you guys are in the envious position that you do serve the consumer direct. Mm -hmm. you, you do have our first party data and the way that you, one way to leverage it is a loyalty program, right? Because mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to grow an existing customer than find a new one. Yeah. Talk to us about um, the Domino's Rewards program and some of the innovations that you have your eye on this year. Yeah, so, um, you know, in 23, in um, September the 12th, we relaunched our loyalty program under Domino's Rewards. And really, it was about bringing more value for the customer. And so there were a few changes that we did. We lowered the minimum threshold to receive points. And then we expanded our redemption menu, as well as added a lot of new perks and other benefits that our individuals get. And, um, you know, in an environment where you're finding a lot of loyalty programs moving in the opposite direction, taking value out. Right, like right? airlines. Did. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Which I'm still mad about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I was really excited that we were able to infuse value, right? And and it's paying off. You know, we're receiving such great feedback from our customers around the new program and providing the optionality that they've wanted for a long time, you know? Yeah. so. We're really excited about Domino's Rewards and what it continues to do for the brand. Yeah. And I'm sure another big piece that you're focused on in terms of just messaging, mediums, communication, mm -hmm. your business is a lot about context, right? Like if the football game, if everyone's watching the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. everyone is going to, everyone's a consideration set, literally in America to buy a pizza, mm -hmm. where at, you know, at, at maybe 9 a.m. local time, not the case, right? Yeah, so that's an example, absolutely. a black and white example of context, yes, right? So absolutely. when you look at, you know, 
digital communication strategy mm -hmm. what has been working and and you know what are some of the things that you're looking at do maybe doing more of to make sure that you can actually uh deliver the right message to the right consumers at the right time yeah like right before the ai hype the buzzword was personalization yeah right <laughs> and it still is and it's still so relevant and it's relevant because of the fact that you know i view all of this as just relationship building yeah, right and, and it's just like at scale any relationship that you have with someone the more you know about that person, you kind of dress them differently. You know, you have a different relationship yeah, as you kind of get more time. Next time I see you in person, I, I'll, I will have the benefit of this conversation. I'll exactly. know what to say from when I just met A hundred percent. And that's where personalization is important, right? And it's about building that tighter relationship and acknowledging the information and what you've learned about that individual, right? And if you can take that and then now make that individual's process life a little bit more simpler, then that's where there, that value exchange that happens from that data transfer becomes really valuable for the end user, sure. right? And so at the end of the day, I think that that from a digital communication standpoint has become and will continue to be very, very important in leveraging the information that our customers have provided so that we can make their lives Such as easier. what? So, you know, from, you know, from personalization experiences within, you know, the e-com experience, right? How am I, you know, bringing you through a flow that's leveraging information like the fact if you never eat meat on your pizza, right. why are we showing you that? You know, like yeah. things like or that. that history. Exactly. That, yeah. that help, you know, drive, you know, a streamlined experience. Payment method, all those hundred percent. hundred percent. So in terms of some of the channels that you're using, um, you know, I know that you probably focus on a younger consumer, although you definitely have a broad audience, mm -hmm. but how are you looking at things like social media, mm -hmm. social commerce, TikTok's rising popularity yeah. as part of your over strategy? You know, social has been a big part of the brand um, for a, a number of years. You know, I've always felt like we've had a very different approach than some brands in the sense of uh, we've always evaluated our, our, well, not always, but for an, a number of years, have evaluated our media, specifically digital media, under a viewpoint of incremental return on ad spend, right. right? And to get that, you really need Lyft studies. And so you need a Lyft platform in that publisher to be able to evaluate no impression versus impression and what's the true Lyft that you're receiving. Not all publishers had that. You're saying you're doing attribution at the awareness level, not just at the performance level. Completely, but right. it, it's all performance media, right, right, at the end of the day. Yeah. And so, um, because we're driving an IROAS that's driving to the bank, right? And so, um, but we don't advertise with publishers that don't have platforms for us to evaluate the lift that we're getting. And so we've built that in concert with the number of publishers from the Facebooks to Snapchat to just recently TikTok, we've played a role in refinement and building out lift platforms so that we can evaluate the success or lack thereof of our media. And so um, TikTok is a space that we are growing. We're the number one pizza company on TikTok right now. Um, but it's through a way of understanding really what's working and what's not working, right? And, um, you know, our viewpoints have shifted over the years. Uh, five years ago, we really weren't leaning into influencers. We weren't finding incrementality in that space. Now it's very different. TikTok has a great platform to do that. And so, you know, we're evolving as, you know, society is evolving and thinking about ways that we can meet them where they are in really meaningful ways. Yeah. And what types of content do, does Domino's see driving that lift on mm -hmm. on a platform like TikTok? Like you know, it's it's different. It's not the same across platforms. Different platforms have kind of a different um, core kind of voice and tonality. And so, like, TikTok has been really fun content and really scrappy content. Like, yeah. it doesn't require a whole production studio and know. everything. You know, it's it's a new um, version of UCG, I think, you know. And, um, and it's really great to see, like, how people are responding to it. So we've done some really fun things in yeah. that space. Absolutely. And in terms of the category that you're in, um, are there changes that you're seeing with the consumer in terms of the things that they want to eat and what they are ordering more or less of right now that ha are driving the product and then as a result, marketing strategy? Yeah, I mean, I think that at the end of the day, customers really just want, you know, hot and delicious food, yeah. right? And so it's it's our responsibility to make sure that we can effectively do that, you know, to the best of our ability. And so it's thinking about all of the considerations from like how long it takes you to actually order it to how long it takes you to actually receive it, right? right. And so I think it's about the convenience, the, the time and effort it takes to order, which um, I think there's this expectation that it be, should be less and less, you know, as, as you kind of continue to build that relationship with the customer. And is pizza a category overall that is 
holding its own decreasing your because obviously mm -hmm. you have like certain form factors like tacos for example yeah. really explode it yeah um you know over maybe a, te a 10 year period pizza sort of been a main it's, at least in american been. culture yeah is it is it kind of keeping up are you seeing any pressure in the category overall yeah i mean i think the pizza category is a fun category and oh, it, yeah. it has weathered many many storms right and during mm -hmm. the pandemic it was an extremely important space because we were delivering you know in yeah. an environment where it was you know, questionable and, and of going out into the wild and, you know, getting food other ways. And so, like, we, um, we, I think through the pandemic, played a really important role in getting, you know, safe, hot food to individuals, right? It's giving consumers a sense of normalcy. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, but, but through that, we had to like reinvent our brand. We never had contactless delivery before the pandemic. And we literally spun that up, I think, in three to four weeks, you know, as we saw, but the world was changing. Is right? that like so, is that like knock knock zoom zoom? Like you basically put the pizza in, you knock on the door, and you drive so away. So <laughs> when we started, we 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 had what we called the pizza pedestal, which okay. was a cardboard like box that was uh, hollow that um, we could put the pizza on because we didn't want to put it on the ground. Right. And, you know, new procedures that we wanted to step back and provide distance and make sure that that pizza was picked up. Crazy, right? To so, come up with that on the fly. Absolutely. And so yeah. it was a change to the digital experience, to the operational procedures, you know, and all of that had to happen really quickly. And so, but pizza has always been part of, you know, our lives in yeah. some form or fashion. And so to find a way that we could still do that in an environment where the world was changing really quickly was really exciting. Yeah. So let's shift gears a little bit to you because you definitely strike me as somebody who's passionate, knowledgeable about the space, mm. continually evolving. Um, how did you find your way um, into this role? Did you always know that you wanted to be in the marketing space? No. Um, okay. So, not at all. Okay. So I, um, my career and um, the marketing space started, um, I joined an agency out of... Um, North Carolina, um, called Pace Communications. Uh -huh. And I joined as a temp in their call center because I needed a job while I was to pay for school. And so I worked full time while I was going to school. And, um, you know, very quickly, I was assigned different projects from the leadership and eventually started helping build out brands um, for white labeling of e-commerce products for different publishers who didn't understand the space or wanted to expand, right? And um, by the time I graduated college, I had, you know, four years of experience in building brands and e-commerce platforms. And so I had to make that decision what I wanted to do because I was pre-law, poli-sci major, took the LSAT, was ready to go I to took the LSAT. Still. <laughs> I was ready to go to law school. But, um, you know, there was just some pa that level of passion that I had for this space. And what I've always said is why I think I've gravitated to digital is that I prefer to be the individual that tells you my performance versus you tell me my performance. Yeah. And the ability to track and understand the influence and impact is why I've always loved digital, right? And so I've just kind of grown through the business from call center up. and um, But it was never kind of my um, initial view of who I would be or the role that I would have in the it's future. Um, but yeah, it is amazing. It's crazy. A lot of people, <laughs> it's a, lot of young, a lot of young people, they're like, they want it now. Yeah, you know they see other people flexing, and they're like, "Oh, I want," and it's just not how it works. It's not at all. You know, you put in the time. No. You work in the call center, and here you are as chief digital officer of one of the most prominent brands in the world. But I mean, so what steps did you take that maybe other people, younger people, yeah. would benefit from, so they could have the same ascent? You know, for me, I think it's always been a level of curiosity and willingness to. Um, feel comfortable in sharing my opinion and doing things based off of where I saw needs, right? So like with the agency, I um, joined and there wasn't really a clean training program. And so six months after I joined, I built a training program. We, you weren't asked to do it. <laughs> no. Initiative. I was like, I was a, initiative is where it's at. Yeah. And so like, I was like, someone needs to have a training program. Some people <laughs> are waiting for permission. They are. And, right. I, and I've always had you know, felt comfortable just jumping out there. And, why? And I don't know why, you know, it's a good question, but I, I've i always felt, as, and maybe it's this desire to make things better for someone else, yeah. right? Like, so someone doesn't have to go through the same struggles and challenges that I went through. But um, that initiative, I think, has provided opportunities that otherwise I wouldn't have received. And those opportunities have laddered me to where I am today. And I mean, you know, it looks like, you know, then you went on to extend its stay. Mm -hmm. 
it, it seems like, and, and literally every two years, you just get promoted. Two years, get promoted. <laughs> two years, get promoted. Um, do you think you've gotten promoted through aptitude or by by just asking? Like, you know, some people are great at their job, but they just keep yeah. their head down. Yeah. And other people, you know, maybe are slightly less great, but they just keep asking. And some people are both. Yeah. Um, but, you know, how do you continue to evolve and go up the chain so quickly? Yeah, you know, and I can honestly say that I've never received a promotion by way of asking for it. I've You're always, always given to you, right? I've always tried at the end of the day, just to show my contributions and impacts, right? Either directly or through the teams that I've had the opportunity to lead. And so for me, it's that's why I've always anchored. I'm like, I don't care about all the other stuff, right? Yeah. Like if I'm making impact, I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm happy, then I'm just gonna keep pushing, you know? And so I've been really blessed and fortunate that I've been in organizations that have acknowledged that and have given me new opportunities. So, I mean, what's... Where do you see yourself in five years? That's like, a what's question. next for you? Yeah, I don't know. There's, um, there's so much. I'm super excited about what we're doing at Domino's. Yeah, and every year there's new excitement. Yeah, and, like I just I learn new things, and I'm continuing to grow as an individual. And so I'm just really excited about where we are and understanding that there's still a ton of runway in front of us. So. But I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm like so kind of cool. keeping it tight. You probably didn't know five years ago that you'd be in this position. I so, had yeah. no. Right. And, and how are you this year? How are you planning on spending your time, maybe a little differently, to make sure that you keep growing and learning and you know, selling? Um, it's a good question. Like I think that you know, I want to continue to challenge myself with understanding you know nuances of the industry, where we're going, and so events like CES provide uh -huh. a platform for me to do that. I um, want to continue to expand my network to understand individuals, but, you know, I um, am really excited about just continuing to build up my team, you know, yeah. so that they are the future rock stars and which they already are. Which is They're incredibly rewarding, that. I can tell you. It really yeah. is. It, I mean, that like, to me, that's the most rewarding thing to see it, that you maybe had a little bit, you know, And then they go influence. on to do great things and exactly. then you're like, wow, I had some type exactly. of role in that. Exactly. So I am really excited to see where this next generation goes and, and how I can be a part of that. That's awesome. So to wrap up here, uh, Christopher, is there a sort of a mantra that you like to live by? I mean, you mm. seem really intentional about your career decisions. I was just wondering, like, if there, you could sum it all up in some type of mantra. You know, I do try to live in this world of work hard, play play hard. Yeah, you know, I, I, love I feel as though, you know, we we grind every day, you know, and we do our best to contribute. But we also have to make sure that we're enjoying this life that we have. Because I do not want to look back and feel like I didn't have a fun and exciting life because of the fact that I was just head down working. And so it's that balance that yeah. has been really important to me. And it's something I advocate for everyone within my organizations and anyone I know that you have to find that balance because you work really hard, but you have to enjoy the the life that your hard work has provided for you. And so I try to find that balance in my life. And hopefully you'll have a chance to play hard here in Vegas as well. Yeah. It's not too hard. <laughs> I don't know. This schedule is a little crazy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's been awesome. I'm, I'm so happy we had the chance to catch Likewise. up. Uh, you know, it's fascinating hearing about your career and the stuff you're working on. I have no doubt you continue to achieve great things uh, at Domino's and wherever else. Maybe thank you, sir. Thanks thank for you having so me. Much. Absolutely. On behalf of Susan Adwee team, thanks again to Christopher Thomas Moore, Chief Digital Officer at Domino's Pizza for joining us today. We're here live in Las Vegas at CES, and be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Till next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care. The Speed of Culture is brought to you by Suzy as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and AGAS Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcast. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for The Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.